This morning, behind the scenes of the Ken Paxton impeachment trial. I'm curious if, if you heard anything during that two weeks, Governor, that, that you think Ken Paxton's behavior might have crossed a line. That's a great question. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's first in-depth interview after the acquittal is with us. Ken Paxton also speaking out for the first time since returning to work, criticizing members of his own party and suggests that he might run against U.S. Senator John Cornyn in three years. State Senator Kelly Hancock, one of only two Republicans voting to convict Paxton. Hancock tells us why he did not follow fellow Republican. And a federal government shutdown one week from today. Congressman Keith Self on why Republicans and Democrats remain so far apart on funding. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to you. Several big interviews this morning, but let's start with the headlines. Ken Paxton's interview the other day is still making waves among Texas Republicans. Paxton slammed House conservatives who impeached him. Paxton also blamed Karl Rove and the Bush family for it. Paxton even said he might run against U.S. Senator John Cornyn in three years. All of this really illustrates the divide between Trump Republicans and Bush Republicans that remain here in Texas. State lawmakers likely to return to Austin next month for another special legislative session, this one on education. Governor Greg Abbott told the Texas Public Policy Foundation that he'll call the session in October to pass school vouchers. But rural Republicans in the House keep voting it down time after time. Abbott, though, is now threatening to campaign against conservatives who defeat it this fall. And the race to replace Congressman Colin Allred in Dallas is getting crowded. Democratic State Rep Retta Bowers is the latest to join the race in North Texas. State Rep Julie Johnson is already campaigning for this seat, along with Dr. Brian Williams and others. Allred represents Dallas County and is leaving Congress to run against Ted Cruz for U.S. Senate next year. A few days after the acquittal, we got a look behind the scenes at the Ken Paxton impeachment trial. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick gave us his first in-depth interview a few days ago. We learned why the alleged mistress did not testify, and we asked Patrick whether any of Paxton's behavior actually crossed a line. We met the lieutenant governor for this interview at a studio in Houston. Governor, thank you for the time. We always appreciate you uh, hosting sure. us. Let me ask you about something that I've heard a lot since the end of the trial. Mm -hmm. People are telling me they think Ken Paxton is now the most feared politician in this state. Do you think that's so? I haven't heard it. Uh, I don't know. I haven't even thought about it, to be honest with you. The House and the Senate obviously have two very different beliefs about Ken Paxton and the impeachment. We've had a few days, though, since the end of mm -hmm. this. How do you think history is going to judge it? One of the reasons I made my remarks after the verdict was in was I wanted to be sure that when history, when those in the future look back at what we did in the Senate and the House, that they had a full picture of what happened. Uh, I believe in the Senate we conducted a fair trial. So I want history to know that the Texas Senate did it right and the Texas House did it wrong. And I don't mean to criticize individuals there. I'm talking about the process. This, this was not as, as um, John Smithy said on the floor. Uh, he said this is not about guilt or innocence, it's about the process. The House didn't go back and look at what the House did in 1917. They didn't look back in the 1800s. If they did, they totally ignored what they did. So the reason I made my statements when I did is 50 or 100 years from now, when the next impeachment happens, they're not going to go back and pull up this interview or something in the newspaper. They're going to look at the record. And so that's what I put my comments on the record. And I think they'll say the Senate did their job. I heard that you had two sets of closing remarks. Is that right? I wrote, I wrote uh, remarks if he was acquitted and if he was um, convicted. The remarks were pretty much the same, just the opening would have been a little bit different. But I was going to say the same thing, because whether he was convicted or acquitted, the House process should have never have happened. It was terrible what they did. And so their remarks were pretty much the same. Look, when I went into this, and I, I don't want to speak for the senators, but I think this would be fair to say, they thought a conviction was going to happen, because the House 
said they had all the evidence. Remember, no one saw the evidence until the trial. No one was on the spot to, under oath, threat of perjury to tell the truth. We assumed at least one of the articles they had a smoking gun. At least one they could prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm curious if, if you heard anything during that two weeks, Governor, that, that you think Ken Paxton's behavior might have crossed a line. That's a great question that would be unfair for anyone to really answer. A person was impeached, just no different than a criminal trial, a person or a civil trial. A person was found innocent by the jury. For anyone to go back now and say, well, we think this or we think that. I mean, I ha you know, we're hearing this scuttlebutt from the House. Well, if you knew what we knew, well, if you had something else, you should have presented it as evidence. Don't come back now and say, well, we had more. That's just a cop out. But, but did, did Paxton do anything that, that you heard that you, that you thought for an attorney general might have been too much? Uh, obviously, there were things that came up in the trial that I think most people, including myself, would look at and say, you know, wasn't, wasn't very smart. I'll just leave it at that. Why didn't Laura Olson testify? So Laura Olson, who was the, the other woman in the, in the trial, for people who don't know, uh, her attorney... And the House said, well, we want to ask her these 20 questions. And then the Senate, I mean, not the Senate, the Paxton side said, well, if you put her up there and ask her 15 or 20 questions and she takes the fifth, that, makes our, that could make our client look guilty. And so we don't have a chance to cross-examine. And so I sat there and, and I thought about it. And I thought, I said to the House, I said, look, I said, we all work this out. And immediately, Aaron Epley, who I thought did a really great job for the House, the, uh, the, the prosecutor, right. immediately said, how about if we say she's present but not available? Those were the words of the house manager, not mine. I didn't write that. And I looked at Tony Busby and I looked at Andy Murr, who was standing behind him, and they both shook their head. They're okay with that. And the reason the house was okay with that was because they didn't want to be criticized for not trying to call her. So both sides felt that was, I think, an iffy witness yeah. that could hurt either case. So they came to that agreement and I want to set the record straight because one of the attorneys on the House side has said, I handcuffed them and stopped that. I had nothing to do with it. That was their decision. Governor, thank you. Yes, sir. We spent a half hour with the Lieutenant Governor. Our unedited interview, available in a special episode of Yolitics. You can download it this morning wherever you get your podcast, or you can watch the podcast interview at the YouTube page for Yolitics. All right, next month, Governor Abbott says he will call lawmakers back to Austin to talk about education, school vouchers specifically. But San Antonio, Plano, and now Fort Worth school districts have all announced they might have to close campuses. Competition from charter schools is part of it. Also, fewer children in the population. Ian Mitra is the senior managing editor of the Texas Tribune in Austin. Ian, good to see you again here. If school vouchers are passed, could that help, you know, really further decline of public education and close more campuses? Well, it does really kind of depend on the kind of the structure of the plan that could pass through here. And obviously, you know, Governor Abbott has made this a priority. This has been something along with property taxes at the beginning of the year that he's really kind of pounded. And it really has and he's really emphasized this, too. And he's even said that, uh, you know, we're going to keep having a couple of special sessions and maybe go into the primaries to resolve this issue. So it really kind of depends on the plan, but also like, you know, the funding structure has to be looked at too when it comes to how school districts are funded. Yeah. And the big question you have and, and we have, and everyone else has is whether the votes are there now to pass it. Rural Republicans have stopped this in the past. Are, are these threats from governor Abbott really going to change anything? Well, it kind of really depends. You know, uh, in August, uh, there was a special committee of the House that kind of looked at the issue after, you know, you know, legislation didn't pass through in the regular session. And they, you know, they made some recommendations about some potential ways where a, a plan could pass, but it would be separate financing than from the public education funding budget. It would also uh, prioritize high, uh, high needs students. And yeah. so that was something that actually might have some some traction in the House. But right now, it's hard to see you know, a broader plan uh, having much success. We'll have to wait and see what happens. I am back to you in a moment. Thank you. Coming up next, one of the Senate Republicans who voted to convict Ken Paxton. The pressure he says he got on the floor of the Senate during the trial. Senator Kelly Hancock is next. Plus a federal government shutdown coming one week from today. Republican Congressman Keith Self on why his party and Democrats cannot agree. Inside Texas politics back in a moment. 
Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. Two Republicans in the state Senate voted to convict Attorney General Ken Paxton in his impeachment trial last weekend. State Senator Robert Nichols from East Texas and State Senator Kelly Hancock from Tarrant County. The question now, will either of these men pay a political price for that consequential vote? We met at Senator Hancock in Fort Worth with those questions. Senator, good to see you again. Senate Republicans say, the, most Senate Republicans at least, probably not you, say that the impeachment case from the House was rushed and it was weak. Judging by some of your votes and some of the articles, though, you saw something different. Well, I didn't, I didn't focus on that as much. I mean, I thought they sent over, and I read it before, to make that first vote, whether we wanted to see anything or hear anything. I thought, uh, I thought they sent over sufficient amount of evidence, along with, you know, the vast majority of the Senate, that they sent over enough that we need to hear something, we need to see something. I mean, people need to understand, acquittal doesn't mean innocent. It could mean, in their opinion, insufficient evidence. It could mean reasonable doubt. There is a difference, and of course, the fact that he's got legal battles in front of him, this situation's before the grand jury in San Antonio. Um, you know, the courts will have to decide that at that point because we obviously didn't have the votes to impeach. What kind of feedback have you had from constituents here? <laughs> More encouragement than I've had in 17 years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I didn't know what to expect. You know, obviously, you know, there was a lot of money trying to put uh, pressure on this jury. A lot of jury tampering, I guess you would call it. Well, was, was there a lot of that? Did you feel a lot of pressure oh, during that two weeks? Uh, my phone blew up on the floor at one point, filled up my text messages. I didn't look at them. During the trial? Oh, during the trial. I mean, while we're supposed to be deliberating, and try, you trying the, to tell me how to vote. And you weren't the only one, I'm sure, who got these. No, in, in fact, and the interesting thing there, they're all linked to the same consulting as the Attorney General. Um, you know, Bannon, Lloyd, you know, Davies from um, Dallas, right. linked to, and so there was a commonality there, but there was a lot of money and pressure um, trying to influence uh, those of us that were going to make the decisions. You're not up for re-election until 2026. Do you expect to pay a political price in this district? You know, um, you know a little bit of my history. You know, I suffered with kidney failure for 30 years. One of the things that taught me, never knowing with the disease I had, whether they would be working or I'd be on dialysis from day to day, was to just take it a day at a time. And when you live a day at a time, the most important thing to do is the right thing within the moment. And so, I didn't, I didn't worry about the next election. I worried about making sure I did, worked as hard as I could to determine the truth based on the evidence and the testimony to come up with a decision that I could live with, that I felt like the guy that knew my heart um, would direct me towards and that I would represent my constituents properly. Looking back now, is there something the House could have done differently? Yeah. I mean, obviously, they didn't get the result they were looking for. Well, what should they have done, though? Well, you know, one of the things, we were on a timetable. I think a key witness was the construction guy, Kevin. You know, he was able to avoid subpoenas or, you know, they don't know where he is. You know, obviously, I, I believe the federal, you know, federal government will find him and he'll be involved in the grand jury uh, situation. Uh, you know, he wasn't available. We didn't get to hear from Laura Olson and, you know, she, would she have pleaded the fifth? Could she even take the stand? We don't know on that one. Um, and so, and, and there were other documents, I think, that uh, because of the time constraints, they may have been able to get hold of. But bottom line, when you lose, obviously there's something you can do differently. I think the facts were there and the, and the testimony was there. Uh, and, and in my opinion, you know, clearly um, the whistleblowers were in my, very credible. I mean, I think he had assembled a great team and they were looking out for his best interest until they finally realized he wasn't going to listen to them and they felt like they had to go to the FBI. And, and you know, that's proceeding. You know, he delayed any of that from coming out to after the election, uh, which I didn't vote on because I don't know that he did that intentionally. Right. Um, but that's going to come out at some point. Senator, thank you. Appreciate it. There is another big political story unfolding right now, not in Austin. This one is in Washington. One week from today, a shutdown of the federal government is likely. 
Members of Congress say this could happen because Democrats and Republicans cannot agree on spending. They had a deal back in May, but a conservative backlash forced Republicans to walk away from it. Congressman Keith Self is a Republican from Collin County who spoke to my colleague, Jason Wheeler. You're probably looking at a shutdown on 1 October because uh, the bills uh, are too large. Uh, we did run on fiscal responsibility. Now, the, fis the Fiscal Responsibility Act that was negotiated with the president was too large. That's why we're not getting appropriations bills passed, because people are rejecting uh, the spending levels that are in these appropriations bills. And we are going to fight, uh, one, for border security, and two, uh, for reasonable uh, budget rather than the explosive growth that are in some of the bills. Are you prepared uh, to, to be for a shutdown, if that's what it takes? I'm not for a short a shutdown, but we are past the point of no return now, Jason. Uh, there's going to be a shutdown. We have, what, uh, nine days left? Uh, maybe it's eight days left in, uh, before the shutdown happens. We've reached the point of, of no return. I can assure your, your vi viewers that absent some sort of minor miracle, which is not going to happen, uh, we will have a shutdown on 1 October. Coming up next, after the acquittal, how has Ken Paxton's image changed and where can it take him? The Roundtable is standing by for that when we come back. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. All right, time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. I am Mitra is back with us from the Texas Tribune. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and Bernadine Steptoe, political producer at WFAA in Dallas. I right, let's start with you. The big question is what's next for Ken Paxton? He has a huge win here. He's a martyr in the GOP. What happens to him from here? Well, certainly he has a big, uh, you know, a launching pad here in terms of, you know, he's, he's got a big political win here and he's, you know, he's also talked about retribution. He's also talked about going after some of the people who went after him, you know, whether it be primary season, whether it be house impeachment managers, whether it be Dave Phelan. So he's really focusing on that. But we can't forget that there's also still some legal battles that he faces related to some of the accusations that he faced at the impeachment. Trial. Yeah, he is not out of the woods yet at all, bud. But but has his image changed? Well, you know, that's the question. I don't know if he's if he's eligible to be reelected again, if he's not convicted of anything. I don't know if he could win reelection. I think it d did probably push the needle enough with moderate Republicans that, that he might not be able to win uh, even a, even a general election against a good opponent. There are two people really involved in Ken Paxton's future, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. If Donald Trump picks him up, takes him around the country, makes him a celebrity uh, more so than he is, then, then you know, he'll just you know, ride that probably all the way to Washington. And Joe Biden's a key because what Ken Paxton needs to do now is focus on Joe Biden not on how many Republicans he can upset or target. He needs to have one target at his sights, and that is Joe Biden. And speaking of targeting Republicans, what happens in the House, Bernadine? Does he go after incumbents in the House who voted against him? You know what? I think that the best thing for Paxton to do is to put this behind him as much as possible, because one of the things that his critics said, when, or, or, and they are saying, is that a number of the voters did not know about a lot of the evidence that was presented during his impeachment trial. So the best thing for him to do is focus, as, as Bud said, on Biden, focus on his legal fights that he's going to have to encounter and move past other Republicans. Because some of those Republicans, their constituents are behind them. So to go out for to retribution or whatever right. he wants to do, to me, that's just, uh, uh, he's using that valuable time that he could use on something else. Does he want to dip into the division in the party? Yeah, the big question there, too. Let's talk about the, the worst kept secret in Dallas politics. I, and I'll start with you. This is uh, Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson moving from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. It's been whispered about for months and months in Dallas. How surprising is that? Well, you know, certainly he's been, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's not a surprise to many folks in terms of like, you know, obviously like Senator Cornyn and Senator Cruz were, you know, people who kind of inaugurated him for his next term. You know, he did a panel at the Texas Tribune Festival this week where he was really touting the, the, his support of police unions, you know, his, his pro-business uh, focus. And, you know, with, with radio host Chad Hasty, I think, you know, there's not a lot of surprise, but it's certainly a big story in terms of like, you know, uh, you know this big city leader and uh, kind of like how he's going to move forward. And, Bud, the big question I think a lot of us have, the, the other whispers out there is whether 
Uh, you know, Eric Johnson stays in office. He just got sworn into a second term earlier this year, or does he do like some of his predecessors, Ron Kirk and Tom Leppert, and run for something else? Well, I think there's a congressional seat that might be open that he could run in, but the you know, uh, the point I'll just make is that Dallas now becomes the largest city in America with a Republican mayor. Until now, it was Fort Worth. Bernadine? Well, and he is a, he will become a Republican mayor, but keep in mind, the mayoral seat is nonpartisan. And as, as you mentioned earlier, the talk has been around that he was going to change parties. And uh, it was just a matter of when and not if. But, but what, Bernadine, what does he do with this changing parties? He, he clearly needs to capitalize off of it somehow. How, how does he do that? Well, I, I would doubt seriously if he stays the rest of his term. So the question is, where does he go from here? And as you mentioned, uh, former mayors Kirk, uh, Lampert, they could not jump from being mayor into any uh, high-level statewide seat. So the question is, what does he do? But I'm sure with the timing that he just did this after he lost his uh, push for in the budget, that it was time to jump ship. But I definitely, yeah. well, not jump ship. We don't know that yet. Right. But he has jumped parties. Yeah. So it is no surprise. But that is a huge question. It, Where it, does he go next? Yeah, it, it, is, it is not a surprise. It is a, a big question we'll be following as well. I and Bud Bernadine, thank you guys very much for your context and perspective as always. We appreciate that. And we really appreciate you watching each Sunday as well. We're back again next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics and hope you can join us then. Take care.